plus four. So you can use them that way too. I see some of you guys are. Okay, great. So we are going to be diving into the book of Romans this year. So like I shared before, um, we went over the gospel of Luke with Joe last year. Um, and so now we're going to be looking at the epistle, which is a letter um, written by Paul to the Romans. Um, so we're going to be seeing kind of why it was written, who it was written to, um, and then the effects of, that it's had on many, many people um, from beyond just the, the receivers of the letter, um, but people through church history and for us today. Um, so we're going to be, my clicker works. Okay, there we go. So yes, the author is the Apostle Paul, written in about 57 AD. It's going to kind of be like a little bit of a history lesson. Um, but yeah, he wrote it to the Christians in Rome. Um, and the theme is the saving gospel of Jesus Christ through faith and the sufficiency of the cross. So encouraging Christians of that it, it is true what Jesus did and the effects that it has on our life now because of that. And it's to show believers what to believe and how to behave in light of that. So before we get into that, I'm going to start with a question for you guys um, that I want you guys to ponder on and to think about as we go through this, as we go through the night. What has knowing Jesus changed in your life? If you can think about that. What has knowing Jesus changed in your life? Is that something that is, is foreign to you to think about? That's okay, that's good. Um, but we're going to be talking about people that because of knowing Jesus, their life changed radically. And for, for the kingdom purposes. Um, so just, just have, that, have that on your mind as we get into this. So we're going to be looking at five men in church history specifically, um, where the book of Romans specifically either brought them to faith or it was a firm foundation that they stood on to pursue the Lord even more purely. Um, and so we can just give the Lord credit for the way that he has continued to work through this specific book um, and how he's continuing to further the kingdom at that so we can marvel at all these people. So, the first person we're going to look at, I don't know how to pronounce his first name, um, Aurelius, Aurelius, Augustine, um, but this man, so he was not a Christian until he was 22 years old, his, his mom was a Christian, she, she tried to, to, to teach him about the Christian faith, she prayed for him, she wanted him to know the Lord, but he had absolutely no desire, and this is kind of a swaggy picture of him in his library. Um, but <laughs> um, he had absolutely no desire. He was caught up in a lot of, of sexual sin and a lot of sexual immorality. He had no desire to, to turn away from his sin. He had no desire to know the Lord. He had no desire to grow in a deeper relationship with the Lord by any means. He rejected it completely. And super, super cool. So do you guys know the little book libraries that are like outside where it kind of looks like a mailbox or like when you go to a state park and there's kind of like a plaque that kind of looks like this, like my music stand. Kind of looks like a plaque that has like information on it. So there was one in his neighborhood in the year 370 AD about, and it had a Bible chained to it. So you know how we have little libraries? They had little libraries like that too. And they actually had Bibles chained to them. And he was hearing a group of kids playing off in the distance and they were playing this game called Tole Legi, Tole Legi, it's Latin, but it means literally take up and read. So Augustine was like, hey, I've never, never thought about Christianity. He, he rejected it, he, he hated it, but because of the way that this was so, this was so weird, he noticed that there was a stand, noticed there was a Bible on it, he heard kids playing this game, take up and read. He went over to the stand, opened up the Bible, flipped it open, a good old holy flip, flips it open. I wish I did it. I got to Acts 18, but he opened up to Romans 13. I was a book away. But he opened up to Romans 13, and he literally read the chapter of Romans chapter 13, and he came to faith through that. The Lord completely changed his life, radically changed his life, and now we know Augustine as being significant for confessions. Like when we say the Apostles' Creed, and we say... In church, in a church service, we say what we believe. Like, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I believe in the Holy Spirit. When we look at that, we can attribute that to this guy. This guy in church history. The Lord used this guy to, to give us that. And this is a hard word. I would be surprised if any of you guys knew what that word is. But biblical exegesis. 
basically that means interpreting the Bible the way it's meant to be interpreted. So when we, when we read passages, if you guys have study Bibles, if you guys have ever seen a study Bible where it gives you a little bit of a, an insight on what the text says, that is how we, how we analyze it, how we're supposed to interpret it. It is, it is exegesis, being diligent with the text. So that we don't just read our Bible and then we just say it's, it's up for whatever you want it to believe or it's up for whatever you think it should mean. But we actually know what Jesus meant when, when the scriptures were written and what, what God meant to be written and how they're meant to be read and applied to our life. So we can thank this guy for that. And just a nice little quote from him. Um, to fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek him, the greatest adventure. To find him, the greatest human achievement. And this comes from someone who completely hated and rejected the Lord. But the Lord came to him through the book of Romans specifically. Romans chapter 13. Then we're going to get into Martin Luther. A little bit is cut off, that's all right. But out of the five people on the list, you'll probably know this guy the most. This is where we get the name Lutheran from. This is why we are a Lutheran church. We can attribute to this guy, that the Lord used this guy. So Luther was a German monk. Does anyone know what a monk is? It's a very devout religious person that chooses to go live in the woods, secluded from anyone else because they just want to pursue their religious endeavors. Basically, they cut themselves away. It's like moving to Alaska, living in the middle of the woods. I don't want to talk to anyone. I just want to read the scriptures and having absolutely zero contact with the outside world. Well, that's what he did. He, he pursued that. He wanted to be intentional about going into the Catholic priesthood. And so that's, that's how he did it. He was big into, into college. He would study the scriptures, all the different avenues. Um, and as he was doing it, he was comparing it this is, it's important to remember, this is the Catholic Church from 600 years ago, but this is not the same. But some of these principles are a reason why we, why we have different denominations and why everyone isn't Catholic and why everyone isn't Lutheran and why everyone isn't Baptist or Methodist. Um, but we look at this because there are specific reasons why there was a break off. That's why there's the Reformation, if you guys know that from Confirmation um, or from other areas, but that's why we have the Reformation and we're a Protestant church because we protested against what the Catholic Church stood on certain topics. So, specifically, Luther found that what the Catholic Church was doing, they were selling indulgences. Basically, the Catholic Church was saying, if you give us money, then we can forgive some of your sins, and we can actually give you, there's a storage of, of extra credit um, back here, and if you give us money, we'll give you some credit, and then the Lord won't look on you with, with wrath as much or you can take years off of your time in something called purgatory. Um, these, these concepts that were, like when, when Luther was, was reading the scriptures, he's like, where is this? Like, how, how is it that I am supposed to buy favor with God? Like, I, I know it's, it's by faith alone that I'm justified, which justified means that we are washed clean. It's completely washed clean. Like, we are seen as righteous before God because of Jesus' righteousness, not of our own works, not of our own doings. We can't earn favor with God because we are sinful. Like, all of us are sinful. All of us fall short of the glory of God. But Luther made a point to stand on, but because of Jesus and his righteousness, that is how we can be put in right relationship with God again. So, that was his big thing. He nailed his 95 theses, basically all of his points that were wrong with the Catholic Church, and said, hey, either change or I'm out of here. The Catholic Church said, not going to do it. And so then Luther, with, with some of his other, other friends and colleagues and other people that saw these inconsistencies, they were like, yeah, like, let's go pursue the Lord the way that we should, by the scriptures alone. So um, we can look at that, like a specific text, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by, by grace you have been saved through faith, not of good works, so that no one may boast. We can't attribute anything to us being saved by our own doing, but it's a work of the Lord. Um, so we can see... These were the five solas. This is Latin. So solas means alone. So we can see sola gratia, so by grace alone. It's by God's grace alone that we are saved, like because we are sinful, like in our, in our very being. Um, the second one is sola fide. It's by faith alone that we are made righteous before God because of faith alone. It's not of our own doing. It is because of the faith that God has given us. It is our belief and trust in him alone that gives us eternal life. And yes, through Jesus alone, solus Christus, soli deo gloria, it is to the glory of God alone. It's not to anyone else, it's not to 
uh, like a like a priest or a pastor. It, it's not to anyone else. It is solely to God alone. Like all the glory goes to Him, and it's from Scripture alone. It's not of anything else. We can look at a comparison. So we can look at Protestant. So this is what we are. We are a Lutheran church. We would be seen as Protestant. And this was when we looked at it. What the Roman Catholic Church stood on specific things. Again, this isn't to bash the Roman Catholic Church, but some of the stances that they stood on, and that the reason why we are still Lutheran today is because of these very, very important points to know what we believe and why we believe and why we stand on these things. So we can see scripture alone when they would say scripture and tradition. Um, we can see faith alone when the Roman Catholic Church said faith and works earn you salvation. So just super important, this is just helpful to look and be like, yeah, this is why I believe what I believe. And it is by Jesus alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, to the glory of God alone. And it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and with this, it was um, actually so bad with, with the, the revolt of like these, these Christians were trying to break off from the Roman Catholic Church and because of power, because of money, and because they were trying to put people kind of into a scenario of fear. Again, this is different now. But at this specific time, have you guys ever heard of like Bloody Mary? Like, I mean, there's a drink that's made after it. It's an alcoholic drink. But a Bloody Mary... Like, the, the specific reason is because the first queen of England, Mary I, was so upset with this reformation that was happening that actually people that believed that by, by faith alone, by grace alone, through Jesus alone, there was actually people, the reformers, burned alive in the cities. They would have, it was about 300 people burned alive because they stood on what the same exact thing that all of us in this room believe and stand by today. And it was because they believed that, that they were burned alive. It was men and women. And it, it's important to know these things. It's important to know what people stood on, what people fought for before us, and to know why, like being able to understand and to be able to accept the blessings that we do have today. Um, another thing, sorry, I'll go back to this original slide. But the thing that Luther was really significant for, it's cut off right here, but he translated the Bible into German. The, the importance of this, it's like, okay, yes, that's super, super awesome to translate into German, but because of the way that church was designed back in the day, it was only in the original languages. So if it was, if it was Greek or if it was Latin, like only, only the, the teachers of God's word knew how to read it and knew how to interpret it and share it in the language that people could hear. So what Luther's point was, because of scripture alone being of importance, he made it a priority that everyone can have a Bible in their hands that they're able to read. And that is huge. The reason why all of you guys have a Bible in your hands today, like this is a huge blessing that people before us trying to pursue the Lord did not have that. And the most that they could get from the Lord is what they got from a Sunday message. And there is no way of being able to dive into it more on their own personal time. So yes, every week I preach justification by faith to my people because every week they forget beautiful thing. We are saved by faith, not of our good works. We are saved to have good works, to honor the Lord and glorify the Lord, but we cannot save ourselves by doing good. It's important. It is absolutely necessary to understand that. Um, yeah, we're going to go through a couple. There's two more people, or three more, actually, but these are a lot quicker. Um, then we're going to be looking at John Wesley. So his, his awesome story was that he came to faith by listening to Martin Luther's commentary on the Book of Romans. So a commentary is what basically someone writes about or like understanding the interpretation. Um, it's what they wrote about that book. So Martin Luther, he stood on these essential doctrines, um, which is what the Bible teaches about something in the Book of Romans. Like it was those doctrines that he stood on. And then John Wesley, we can look a couple hundred years later, he comes to faith by actually hearing Martin Luther's commentary and and it just it coming together and like the lord using this to transform people's lives like specifically this book and what people have have been changed by this book um he proceeded to, to lead a spiritual revival movement in england um when he came to know the lord it was like i know the lord and now i need to tell everyone about the lord because if i know what i believe and i know that it is true and i know that those who are in christ will be saved and i know that if people do not hold to that, if people do not believe in Jesus, if people do not have faith in Christ, there is a terrible thing that's coming to them, because we can't save ourselves by our good works. It is truly because of Jesus that we are saved, and so that's why it's so important that we share Jesus with people. So, 
he took it to the extent of he was a huge evangelist, um, very enthusiastic about preaching the gospel wherever he could. And that's why we have the Methodist denomination right now. Um, super cool, like denominations coming after like people that are super passionate for the Lord. Um, and this was just him describing like how his heart changed and how he like truly like by hearing the message of this was just like the feelings that he was feeling inside. Um, describing it in his heart, which, which God works through his heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That it's, it's Jesus' work in us that saves us. We, it is not of our own doing, and that's why we, we hold to that. And that's, It's probably going to get repetitive, but the same thing with Martin Luther, why he preaches justification by faith every week. It's why I'm going to share it is not us that saves us. It is Jesus, and that's why it's so important to build a relationship with our Heavenly Father who has made a way that we can go to heaven. Like, that is just mind-boggling because we're so undeserving. Then we're going to be getting into John Calvin. This is another another reformer, similar time to to Martin Luther. Um, he would he would have strong foundations on doctrines. Again, doctrines is what the Bible teaches about a certain topic, about election and predestination, big things. So if you if you've ever read like in First Peter or Romans chapter eight, um, or like we can see in Ephesians one, Philippians one, it talks about those that God preordained or those that God predestined to know him or that the father draws to the son. Like the, these concepts of, of God being sovereign, which means that he is all-powerful, all-knowing. He is able to do anything he wants, whenever he wants, and that he knows from the beginning of time who will come to have faith in Christ. So this concept of, of, of election and predestination where God knows who will come to saving faith through Jesus um, was a thing that he stood on because it's important to know that, yes, we cannot save ourselves, but he who began a good work in us of Jesus, he will bring it to completion on the day of Christ, like his return, that there is a promise in that, that all believers can have assurance of salvation. If you are truly born again, blood washed, you trust in Christ alone for your salvation, and you have genuine faith, and you have repentance, and you turn away from who you once were, and you trust Christ, there is a promise that he will never leave you. You are given a promise of eternal life. And the encouragement is that when we hear that promise and that offer of eternal life, why would we waste our life of not getting to know our creator more, our savior our God who chose to give us life. Like, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that's why, like, I'm so passionate about the Lord now. I didn't understand that. When I grew up, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to, to learn more about Jesus. I didn't care. But it was when understanding these deep truths about who God is, is, is the way that the Lord worked in my heart. It gave me a desire. And that's why I, I love you guys, genuinely. Like, it's crying today like of just thinking about you guys and how blessed I am to have all of you in here and to be able to share you the truths of God with each of you and praying that through that that the spirit can move so just yeah I love you guys and that's why like this is the reason why we do what we do and why we share what we share um so led to the Presbyterian Church um super super great this is a little tricky of a quote basically meaning that you will not truly fall away, which scripture, scripture talks about this, that those who are truly in him will never depart from the faith. But those that do depart were never in him in the first place. So like the importance of like, if you are truly, like if you truly have faith in the Lord, you will never lose your salvation. It's not possible because you didn't save yourself in the first place. It was Jesus and Jesus never lies. That's why we can have that, that assurance. And then this is the last guy, Jonathan Edwards. Um, so he grew up, with a pastor as a father, and so that same thing I was just talking to you about, about, about election, about predestination, these concepts where God knows who will be saved before they're even born, um, was something that was really hard for him because he, he, saw, he saw flaws in it. He looked around it and he was like, how could God, who is loving, like, so he 
he knows who will come to know him, why doesn't he save everyone? Like, great question. That's a really, really great question. Like, if God is loving, why would he only save some? And he wrestled with it, and that was hard for him. It's, it's hard to comprehend. It's something that was really hard for me to, to comprehend looking more into. It's something that Caden, my wife, has really hard. And it's like, because we know in Scripture that God desires all to come to repentance and faith. He desires that. How could God desire something, but it doesn't come to be true? Because we know that not all will, will come to know Jesus, and we know that the path is narrow to Jesus and, and to everlasting life. And we know that the road is broad, it's big, that many will go down the road to destruction. So this was something that was hard, and he was, it's just hard to wrap your mind around. But the beauty is that, like when Jerry shared last year of, like, why do bad things happen to good people? And the boiling it down is that we're not good people. And, and we, may, we may think we are, but we are all sinful. In, in Psalms 51, like it talks about, like David talks about, like I was born in iniquity. I was born in sin. Before I was even born, I was, I was sinful. Like of, of this way that we, we come into this world with this condition because of the fall, because of sin. But it is because of Jesus that we are redeemed. And it's, and it's something, it's completely praiseworthy that he who saved us because we can't save ourselves, he deserves all glory and all praise um, to that. So with him, he was asked to write down his testimony. So he was at college and he was pursuing like pastoral ministry. He was in college and he was asked to write down his conversion story. And so he ended up right, starting to write down his conversion story. And right in the middle of it, he realized God's sovereignty, God's entire work with making him even come to faith in the first place and how his life specifically went from area to area and he realized, wow, I didn't have anything to do with that. Like, that's completely of the Lord, that I even know him and that I have a relationship with him. So all glory be to him. Um, so just a beautiful thing. And he went on to be a, a big person over, over England and, and sharing the gospel and being able to just, like, bring the truth of God's word to people. And so that was also found in Romans. Um, and yes, you contributed nothing to your salvation but the sin that made it necessary. We need a savior, and none of us are good. I am not good. I am a bad, sinful person who has been redeemed and washed by Jesus, and that is the only, that's the only thing I have to my name. And then, we're going to look at this. This is going to be a lot more of the fun part for you guys, I think. That was our little history lesson. Um, but these are going to be additional testimonies. It's not just going to be the people who were famous and now they're remembered for hundreds of years or even a thousand years, but these are just super quick. Me specifically, the first verse that ever stood out to me was Romans 12, 9. I remember I thought I was a Christian my whole life. I, I, I went through the same thing that you guys are doing. I went through Sunday school. I went through confirmation. And as soon as I got done with confirmation, I stopped going to church. I had no desire. I would go on Christmas and Easter. And that was it for my faith. Like, I, I had no desire to grow in a relationship with the Lord. And coming here, coming to Living Word, which, praise the Lord, of like a Bible-preaching church, and it gets us to open up our Bibles. Like, how that is a beautiful thing and how we can practice that. Um, when I, over the, over the summer, I'll share next week. Next week's going to be a message over kind of my testimony, and it's going to be about what is the gospel, the truth of the gospel. So I'll give you a little bit for this week, then you'll have to come back next week to hear the rest of it. But... The verse is, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, and hold fast to what is good. Okay, first off, I had no idea what abhor meant, um, A-B-H-O-R. So I googled it, and it means to view with disgust or hatred. So, in scripture, it says that we are called, if for love to be genuine, we need to hate what is evil, and we need to love what is good. And that's all in the eyes of the Lord. And I was convicted of my sin. And I realized how actually serious my sin was. And not only the sin that I committed, but the sin that I gave approval to. Because we can see, we'll dive into it at the end of Romans chapter 1. It talks about how not only is our own sin bad, but it's actually worse. The sin that we give approval to. Which is, again, a hard thing to understand or wrap our minds around. But it's, it's what... God speaks on this. It's important that we have a heart posture that is 
commendable and desiring to be changed by the Lord and that he is right and we aren't. And then next one, Caden, my bride. Um, a big thing, she came similar background of growing up kind of in the church, kind of a little bit of teaching. Um, but yeah, coming here to Living Word and, and opening up the scriptures. And she shared on how Romans 12, 2 was a really convicting thing. And for her in her situation on, on her bed of reading this, of do not be conformed to the world, to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Through one verse, the Lord spoke to her and gave her a complete understanding of her sin and her need for a savior. And the Lord was in that. And the Lord has transformed her. And beautiful thing. And then as we were talking about this this week, my friend, um, Jordan, I was he, he's also a fellow youth pastor. He's going on for pastoral ministry. Um, and he was just asking me, he was encouraging me, he was wanting to pray for me for this upcoming school year, which was super, super awesome to just have a friend like that. Um, and he was asking what we we're going to do for kickoff. And I was talking about we're going to go over Romans, and then we're going to go over the lives like affected by Romans. We're going to talk about a bunch of old dudes, and then we're going to talk about people that would be more re more relatable. And he was like, he was just like super duper smiley. And then he was like, yeah, so my mom, like he was saying that his mom, Jordan's mom, she read through Romans chapter 12. And it was through that whole chapter like all the things that were in there that she came to true saving faith like just like that like the lord used that in that way um so obviously we can we can see an emphasis on romans chapter 12 so <laughs> be intrigued about going on to the year but the the point of all of this is that the lord has specifically used this book of the bible in transformative ways in really really big ways and to be a, a thing that is encouraging and to be seeking the lord as we study through this book this year. Um, and it's super important to, to see what the resemblances are in all those people. So yes, Kate and I, we won't be remembered as long as Martin Luther will be. Maybe the Martin's name will be remembered for over a hundred years, but probably not. <laughs> um, but we are called to be faithful and we share in the same facts as those people that walk before us and even though they have pretty big credentials which is super cool it's all to the glory of god but the similarities that we do have is that we were all born in sin and in john 8 34 jesus says truly truly i say to you everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin this is being unable to escape our sinful patterns without jesus we can't we are slaves to it it's like bondage um, when they were slaves to Pharaoh in the Old Testament, they, God needed to free them from that. We are unable to free ourselves from that. Um, two, by God's grace, by his grace, he revealed himself through the truth of his word in the scriptures. This is why we say to open up our Bibles when we get into studying the scriptures. Obviously, today is more of an overview, but if there are specific verses that stood out to you, great jot them down and being able to look back at them later tonight or later throughout the week or maybe you take one verse a night um, something like that to be in that um, but in John 5 39 Jesus says and he affirms you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me so Jesus confirms that he is in the scriptures that's how we find Jesus if we want to feel Jesus then we get into his word. If we want to hear Jesus, we read what we're reading in the Bible out loud. That is how he audibly talks to us. So if you are looking for Jesus, dive into your word. And if you need help or you need a Bible study partner, this is, again, this is why we have leaders that are willing to serve you. We can do really low maintenance things. We can do text Bible studies. It's super, it's super easy. It's nice to have a little bit of accountability to have someone that kind of can mentor you a little bit in that. But also just encouraging you guys, like, hey, reach out to a friend. Would you like to? Would you like to go over this specific scripture with me? I don't really know about it. Um, but being able to wrestle with someone is, is super, super great. Um, third, all these people, their lives were genuinely changed by grace through the saving power of the gospel. So in First Peter one three, it describes this process. Peter writes, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ." 
According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So, just as much as we had an impact on our physical birth, like, who, who chose to be physically born? Did anyone have a choice in that? Like, when we think about that, the same concept goes for when we're spiritually reborn. Like, we, we don't have an effect. In, like, we don't have a, a, a choice in it. It may, it may feel like it, but actually the work that Jesus does within someone's heart is completely to him and completely to the glory of him. That's how we can have a proper understanding um, towards him. Um, and then this last thing, so by grace they went on to proclaim the truth of Christ so that more people may be saved. It's because those people understood what they believed and understood that Jesus is real and understood that they were sinners bound for hell and that they were saved by Jesus. And so they want to share that same truth with everyone that they encounter for the point of either furthering the faith of those who are saved and to also go and reach the people who do not know Jesus. Which I love this, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Does anyone know what that little section is called? It's, it's the Great Commission. Good job. Yes, it's, it's the Great Commission where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then there's a promise, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus gives us a commandment to teach everyone to obey God and his commandments, and he gives us a promise that he will be with us forever. It surpasses time. That is that, that, that promise that he gives us, that he will never leave us, and that it's, it's an incredible thing to hold on to. So as we end here, we are going to look at some questions for you guys to ponder. Your, your small group leaders also have these questions for you guys to discuss a little bit more. Um, but what is one way that you desire to grow spiritually this year at Ignite? Number two, what is one way that you can prioritize God more this year? And number three, what is your faith story? So, also I just checked the time. We got like five minutes left. So, we do have a plan. You're going to go to small groups. Take these questions with you. So, when your small group... When you, wait, 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 wait. Please, please listen. Okay. Because we have to be time efficient here. Your, your small group leaders will re read those questions to you if you want to jot them down to think about them. Or I can even text them out, email them to you guys. But... When you guys get to your small groups, your small group leaders, the volunteers that have came here to love on you, to serve you, to show you Jesus, they're going to share their testimonies with you of another, another person where their lives have been transformed by the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, someone that is relational with you and that is here for you each and every week, and so be encouraged by that. Okay, let's pray quick. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you so much for your transforming message. Lord, we give all praise, honor, and glory to you. And I just pray that, that hearts can be receptive and hearts can be in awe of the way that you have worked in so many people's lives in so many different ways. Um, so, Lord, give the leaders um, encouragement that, Lord, you are with them um, and that they can just show you off in the way that you have transformed their lives. So, Lord, be with the students this week and, and everything. 